two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Here we are, Mark and James. And uh, the voice you can hear now is James. And the voice you can hear now is Mark. And you might be watching on video. You might be, in which case you'd be able to see um, James and Mark uh, wearing the same clothes as we were last week. Yeah, well, we've only got one set of clothes. We're yes. busy people. We haven't got time to change. <laughs> maybe we'll change for next week. Yes, maybe we will. That's a good idea. We'll, uh, we'll have to pop down to the shop and yeah. buy some new clothes. Because <laughs> that's what you do when you change clothes, yes. isn't it? That's what you do when you change clothes. <laughs> um, how's your week going? You've been, you're in writing mode again, aren't you, at the moment? I am, yeah. I'm close to finishing um, the new John Milton book, which at the moment is called The Alamo. Uh, that might change, but um, uh, it's set in Brooklyn, in New York, which has been quite fun. I've wanted to take him there for a long time, um, down in Coney Island and... Um, Little Odessa, Brighton Beach, all that kind of area. So lots of atmospheric um, set during a blizzard in in New York with you know loads and loads of snow. Really good fun. Uh, it's been a good one to write. So kind of a more um, enclosed Milton. The last one, Blackout, was the tenth, and I made that deliberately quite global with a big cast of characters. This one's much more personal, much more like an episode of The Equalizer, which is kind of the inspiration for Milton when I got started. So um, fans have been asking for that kind of book again. So looking forward to getting that finished and getting it out there. Yeah, and I saw, I got a sneak peek of the um, covers you've had in from Stuart so far, and they're, they're looking yep. good. Yep, he's given me three concepts to look at, and I'm pretty sure which one of my favorite is. Um, and I also just popped them on Facebook, into my Facebook group, and um, I'd say 80% of, of readers are going the way that I, I am as well, and Stu also prefers the, the one that's out in front. So when you get that kind of response, you can be pretty confident that's the one you need yeah. to go for. Well, if you're watching YouTube, we'll stick them up as well so people can see those three concepts in from Stuart. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting area that um, I think for those of us uh, on the other side of the pond, New York has one kind of image, obviously, of Manhattan mm. and mm. downtown. And funny enough, John and I, who's down there on the floor where we keep him, uh, we flew into New York last year when, on our way to Nink and we had a meeting in, in New York with Teachable crew. And we got held, the, the 747 we on, for about 15 minutes because of what they described as a VIP movement at JFK Airport. Excuse me? <laughs> yeah. VIP movement. Yeah. Donald Trump went to the toilet. Yeah. Well, this was in the Obama days, so oh, okay. I, I think it was Obama. And they close off all the airspace for a bit where the aircraft comes in and goes out again. Anyway, so we circled exactly that area out on the coast. And you look down and you think this looks nothing like anyone would imagine. New York. Like, there's beaches, there's sand dunes, there's swamps. It looked a little bit like Florida in places. And lots <laughs> of little marinas with boats. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the landscape changes quite a lot as you go towards the, um, the Atlantic coast on that side. Once you're the other side of the East River. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's been fun to to. I mean, I've I've been there a little bit, but not much. But Google obviously is is all over that. So Google Maps and Google Earth has been fantastic for research. It's such ever. a such a boon, isn't it? Um, and it's I've done easy, yeah. I've done the same thing. Even though it's close to you, for me, it's quite a long way. But to take the when you have somebody walk down a street and they walk past the phone box and past the post mm -hmm. office to the church, you can do it exactly. Yep. As that. Uh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, my my books are always authentic in that way. It's so easy to do. And also, I think when you, you think it's authentic, it, that kind of authenticity trans, transmits to your readers as well. So it's always something that I try to make sure I'm fairly fastidious about. So, yeah, yeah that'd be fun. Looking forward to that one coming out. The, the last book was the best launch I've had by miles, and each one is better than the last because my audience is getting bigger and bigger, obviously. So I'm um, looking forward to, to getting that one out there. Good. Okay, let's move on to our feature interview. Now, this is something that you probably won't uh, make too much use of, but a lot of authors at the beginning of their career, and myself included, uh, do need to think about uh, not just writing for creativity's sake, for our own sake, but for thinking how commercial is this going to be? Mm. Uh, is this idea going to work? Now we had Dave Chesson on a few weeks ago, who's got a bit of software called KDP Rocket, and he talked about his book idea validation process, sort of things you can do and you can think about. We mentioned coincidentally at the time, Pat Flynn, whose uh, book, uh, Will It Fly? I saw some excited posts from Pat Flynn this week because he's 
he found a copy of his book, a paper copy of his book in Barnes and Noble on the bookshelf. Ah. And it was a bit of a, in his life, said this is a moment for him. <laughs> so he's taken lots of pictures and brought his family in. Oh my God. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> for all of that. Um, so it's a sort of an achievement for him. Oh, well done, Pat Flynn. So his idea, his, his book really is about, you know, market testing the idea. Now, when companies start up and they're, they're new, they don't do a huge amount of this. Big companies like Heinz and uh, General Motors and so on, they spend a lot of time really examining a market pre-doing any kind of big investment work on the idea. Why don't we do the same? It's absolutely, uh, there's the ability to do that now. So all these guys are putting together some ideas. Now what Brian Spangler, who is our guest today, has done is he's using data scraping, a concept we're familiar with um, from previous interviews. Uh, to and it's almost a traffic light system. I'll let him explain it in the interview. But an, I, a way of you seeing what genres are a popular but b not particularly competitive. For instance, would be a really good genre for you to go mm-hmm. uh, and, and enter. So let's uh, let's have the interview and we'll have a chat off the back. I am a software engineer by trade. I've been a software engineer for. Oh my, it would date me um, over 25 years now. Uh, I mean, going back to pre-Windows, when it was just DOS and you and a keyboard and control delete was king. Wow. So it's the only way out of a slippery mess. I've, I've pretty much covered every aspect. I'm still in IT. I cover, I moved out of application development uh, a couple months ago to concentrate on uh, cybersecurity and the whole you know, that's uh, just to uh, broaden my experiences. Uh, but before I did that, there was a project I happened to be on that was very heavy into some newer client-side technologies that I hadn't had a good amount of exposure with. And rather than, so you, you go home and you crack open the book. In the old days, you would go to Sam's or get a Sam's book and you would look through all the samples and you would find stuff to try and drive code development and learn it on the fly. And I absolutely did not want to do that again. It was ad nauseum. I've done that so many times. Uh, in the meantime, at night, I like to write books. Well, I try. I write short stories. Sometimes they turn into a book. Sometimes they turn into nothing. And they sit in the uh, Pages app and never go anywhere. Um, and in 2016, I had a contract with one in print that wasn't the best experience and I really, uh, one of the things in my writing experience that I found has kind of hurt but has helped, that, that some authors find very helpful for them, is I span genres. I tend to, I had written originally in a supernatural, uh, uh, done a paranormal supernatural called Superman's Cape, and I had moved on to a contemporary fiction called An Order of Coffee and Tears, which is still one of the better selling books. And I never had a sequel for it, and I moved on to dystopian and then a, and then doing crime thrillers so I kind of jump around whatever story is renting space in my head is generally the story that comes out uh, but growing into this market or growing into a market gaining readers I'm starting to learn from keyboards and from you know all the forums online that you really need to you know in, in addition to making your craft better you you need to find your readers uh, Chris Fox did an excellent right to market. I start and when he when that was becoming popular, I had already been looking and studying Amazon's categories. Uh, I've always studied the categories and the rankings. I mean, I'm I, I'm a systems engineer, software engineer. I like numbers. I mean, I can't help it. I look at a website, and while you'll see content or others will see content and they'll see the styling, I'll go right to inspect the inspector and look under the code, look underneath and look at the, uh, the, co- the, the JavaScript or I'll look at the CSS and see how they style a certain element because I want to learn from that. But uh, when it comes to Amazon and the rankings, it was always this, well, what is the magic recipe there? How are they doing that? And what, can it, what does it mean to me? Yeah. So selfishly, when I started to develop an app and I wanted to use a sample app, the very first thing I thought to do was, let me start collecting data and see what's what. You know, in the real world, if we're trying to find or if we're trying to build a trend or trying to build heuristics around something, the very first thing you do is just flat out collect data. So 
looking at fiction because I don't I'm not familiar with nonfiction, although nonfiction could be added. Looking at just fiction, I started collecting data, and that was that's got to be about seven or eight months ago, uh, where it's basically there's a job that runs in the back end, and it, a couple times a day, five or six I think, and all it does is collect data, and then it then it was my turn to step in, and some of those technologies like Bootstrap and Knockout JS, all the client side stuff that I really really needed to get into. Uh, I started to play around with, and next thing I know, I had a website. Okay, and I mean, that is that's what genre report is. And and some people will not um, <clears throat> they'll not know what Bootstrap is, but they don't have to know a lot of the technical details that no. you're talking about. So what you've created here, <clears throat> excuse me, what you've created here is a portal that people can use. Now, is this? Let's get, wind back a little bit. You talked about your you just sit down, you like to write, so the genre you're not necessarily genre specific and therefore this right. is something that this is obviously come from that but is yep. is genre report something that's going to work for people who work more narrowly than you before we move into the detail you know it that's a that's a great question if i was one of the questions i was thinking you might ask when i walked in when i when i wanted to sit down to this was who would want to use this so for me i'll i'll, I'll speak to me first as because i think of me selfishly I had no idea what I would want to write to next. All I knew was I did not want to come up with a great story and then plop it into a category that nobody would ever see. And one of the best things to do was look at the data, find a category that would ha that had a healthy number of readers and a you know, whether they're voracious or not, they read a lot of books but not be overly competitive where I just had no chance of visibility. Success on Amazon, in my opinion, it's about visibility. Mm -hmm. If you don't have visibility, I mean, you can gain it elsewhere. There's the Facebook ads. Uh, Mark does a terrific, terrific uh, set of videos on that. There's AMS. There's BookBub. But if you're just looking to find a home for your books, that's where this genre report you could at least get instead of spending hours and hours and hours and hours going across all the Amazon pages and looking at the rankings and the top 100, looking at the keywords. This is that one place you could go just to get the homework done. Okay. It's th think of it as like you know I got a I got a lot of homework to do. Here's one place I can go. I can have it done in five minutes. And that was really my my first inclination was just to get this in here so I could find categories that fit me. You know, for example, I'm working on a crime thriller right now. It's, uh, and I, and I, I happened to find a category, uh, about two or three, about a month ago now, about a month ago. And my story is working into that category. Uh, in other words, instead of it, instead of the story taking place in the inner cities of Philadelphia, it is now taking place elsewhere in the country and pulls in elements of that area of the country so it fits within the category and I'm also bringing in characters and the uh, a, a set of detectives and everything that fit that category. Cover will fit that category. Keywords will fit that category. I want to give that book every opportunity I can and when it, so when a reader comes across it because they happen to be browsing that category, they click on it. Because if they pass it over like they've done before, then I've lost. <laughs> yeah, this just gives me that extra edge. You know, you've got milliseconds. I think by the time somebody looks at your book and then moves on to the next one, so yeah. get it while you can. And one of the better things that people often overlook is where you put your book. Yeah. So now for the narrow, if you're like I think of Mark Dawson, he's got an audience. He has he has his readers. How would he use this? How would he want to look at genre genre report? That's not the easiest one to say. How would he look at this website and say, "What's it going to do for me?" So, one one of the things I mentioned earlier is I collect data. So five six times a day, it's collecting all this data. And uh, what am I going to do with all this data? I added this trends and history reporting so that you could go in and you could pick a particular category that you've done well in, or maybe you're not doing as well in. And you can now bring up, oh, I think it's like 10 or 12 different charts going back six months or more. And you can see maybe the page count changed. Maybe the pricing changed. Maybe the average rank across the top 100 has shifted. 
what would that tell me? That might tell me that the readers are moving to another, it's reader shift. Maybe they're moving to a peer category within that, uh, peer subcategory within that parent category. You know, they're not as interested in uh, post-apocalyptic. They're interested in um, genetic engineering under science fiction. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I did the trends in history, is to try and give you an idea of where the readers are, have they moved, maybe the styling and the covers have changed, maybe the expectation on page count has changed. So for the person who already has a set of readers, already has their market, this will let them just tap into any shifts that might be taking place and maybe even get ahead of that shift. One of the features that I want to do, this is another JavaScript framework that, or library that I want to play with is heat maps. I've got all this data. Let me put a heat map up there and actually visualize it because I love visualizations. Visualize the shifting readers. It's nothing, but I, it might be nothing more than eye candy, but it sure is fun looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's no, very entertaining. That sounds great. We should, we should just say that um, I think you said to me that at the moment it's free. Is that right? So you're looking for people. Yeah, to join. yeah. It's really there's a uh, thousand users I think right now, something like that. As a couple of users a day, it's really there's one, two, three, five servers that are running in the back end to keep it going. Uh, it's really, at this stage, it's an exercise for me, for fun. It's to learn uh, both on the writer's side and the market side and finding categories, but also to work my skill set up because I have to stay in my field. You have to stay on top of it because the landscape is ever-changing, just like readership is ever-changing. Landscape and technology is forever changing. Uh, you can spend six months on one project and all of a sudden find yourself well, now you're a little bit behind everybody else. And right. so this is one of my excuses to keep going. A good exercise uh, for you from your professional is, career as is. well. And, and, um, and I think you're, yep. right, you're right to start off writing it for yourself because I think that's how projects work when they're very specific and then you can develop over time. And you've already obviously got a 1,000 people who are using it. And you must have some data on how people are using it. I guess some of them not using it at all and some are using it a lot. And it, it, you find it, what's the feedback like? I would say uh, the feedback, I've gotten uh, quite a bit of feedback, some excellent feedback. Uh, one of the earliest pieces of feedback was the resulted in what's called the Top 100 tool. This was an individual, uh, I'll put a shout out there, Susan May, you're terrific, I love you. Uh, she's an awesome writer. She, uh, she needed, she was doing a lot of homework trying to find categories for books that already existed. And I've done this too. We've all done this, where it's like, Amazon's changed their categories. Just in fiction, I think I capture data on almost 1,300 a day. Easy, easy, 1,300 subcategories and subcategories. And that's a very small number compared to the number of categories on a whole. And so she had this um, need where she's like, rather than spend half my day finding categories that my book would place well for that additional bump in visibility, is there a way you could do that through this app? So born was the top 100 tool. You put in your ASIN, you put in the current rank, you pick some categories and peer categories, uh, you can filter on popularity, and, and a report pops up and it tells you exactly what place it will be within the top 100 of a given category or show you above the 100. And that's, of course, above the 100 would be an estimated. Yeah. So that way you, you know, at that point it's just an email exercise to KDP saying, place my book here, you know, so you can gain that extra visibility. So it's, the feedback is adding to the site. So it's, it, it's um, if you think in terms of like a project plan, they become my JIRA tickets and my JIRA tickets for new tasks that I'm going to work in in an upcoming sprint. Uh, not all the features work. I've gotten, I've gotten some for nonfiction, which is... Uh, it's that's that's a bigger in effort because I would have to scale the infrastructure because there's just that many more non-fiction categories than there are fiction categories. So then it just becomes a, an exercise of volume. The the databases would and the and the backend uh, cache would have to extend would have to be extended. Uh, the one really really good one I'll mention Kindle Shorts hadn't even looked at it. It was right. it's part of the bestsellers list. I work off the bestsellers list because uh, that's what gives me my that's what my algorithm for doing the ranking and determining whether you're competitive uh, category or a popular category or both or not both. And uh, somebody mentioned, could you do Kindle Shorts? And within a day, I added Kindle Shorts. 
So while everybody else was at six months of data, they're now at the Kindle Shorts are about a month of data. So it's just a matter of adding it, and then it, it once it gets added to the job, it starts to populate on the screen automatically. So yeah, and I'm just having a look through now. I, I love the visual, visualizations as well. Um, it helps people like me who don't necessarily jump at the chance of reading through a table of data at, at a glance. Yeah. Really, to it tells those stories. And um, there's two things that, that that I think obviously you've got the the popularity score and you've got a competitive score next to that. Yeah. And in the case, I've looked up a very popular genre, so I've got a green popularity score, but a red competitive. Oh, yeah. In other words, you know, you're going to be fighting for for space there. The other you thing will. that struck yeah. me quite early on was the pricing. Um, this is a pretty good way because that's a difficult area, pricing and. Um, I don't think anyone's really got it thoroughly cracked in terms of a, a formula, but here you have empirical evidence of what people are doing at the successful end of that genre in terms of price. They raise their price. They raise it. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah, I've been finding they raise their price when you start seeing the more popular genres over time. As if it if it was if it went from say yellow orange to red meaning the competitiveness went up because the popularity went up, it's generally going to have the higher rank or the better rank, and not higher, the better rank. You'll see, you'll, you will sometimes see a trend in raising the price. And that's, if you think about that, I've, it, I've known authors that do that forever. It's, if you've got a book in the sub 1000, you're going to raise your price. You, you can raise your price. Some, I, I generally don't see it go the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. So the average price of thrillers is $5.27 in the, um, in the top end of that that's pretty high so yeah there is some work i need to do in pricing because you will once in a while receive and i'll see this in the data a 99 cent will make it in the top 100 as like a book bub and it might gain some it might have a longer tail and it'll stay there so right now where pricing's average it should be it should be rethought in some degree but it, it over time it doesn't i don't know that it it, it works in as as more as part of the trend yeah okay. the trend overall the trend overall will show you a curve for uh, positive or negative okay well i'm looking now i mean thrillers obviously was a bit bu a busy and popular genre I've, I've switched over to just to have a look at lgbt um as a slightly more uh, specialist genre and now i'm getting a real mixture there of gray yellow green for competitive areas once once you start breaking it down so if you were if that was a broad area that you thought you might write in i can see straight away how you you can see do you know what there's a, a there's that special mix of popular but not that competitive um right areas for you to focus in on and then you can look at average price and i mean i can see just at a glance uh, brian that this is going to be uh, something that i think will work for a lot of people i think it's going to be incredibly useful so you're no, I'm glad. Just going back a little bit, you, sorry, I, maybe I missed it when I asked about the um, sort of business model behind it. It's free at the moment. Do you think you're going to charge at some point? Is this something you're going to find another way of, of having a revenue stream geared around it? Or if if, if the only the only reason I would charge for it is if the if enough if there was enough use of it on a daily basis, where uh, I, the back end services began to go up in price or yeah. where I, I just couldn't afford to keep it because right now I think I spend uh, it's not the cheapest it's a hundred or two hundred and fifty or something like that to keep it going and it was my own project it was my own thing so I had I had taken some book money and funded it for like through to the, the middle of 2017 on my own just to keep the back-end servers running uh, but but it's it's when you start to exceed a certain bandwidth and like I have scaling out in Amazon, uh, some EC2 instances, and I'm also using Azure. So I, I believe in, you know, dividing dividing the architecture up. Uh, so there, the cost is it will go up as the usage goes up. And at that point, I may do a donation if people really are using it. Uh, and then if, but if the donations is something, if I opt out of the donations and maybe, uh, a PayPal button and yeah. then the PayPal button would be yours to use unlimited usage, $25 a year, you know, something like that. Yeah. 
but I've been, I've been, I have been asking some of the, some of the people who have been, some of the authors who have been, who have been providing feedback. You know, what would you, tra- what would you be willing to pay for this? Because it's, is it something you would use every day? Maybe not. Is, is it something you would use as you uh, come into a new project? Yes. Is it something you would use to uh, do some work on existing books? Yes. But it isn't something that you would use every single day. Uh, unless you're a publisher. If you're a publisher, yeah. uh, if, you're, and you, if you're a small publisher and you've got, if you're supporting five to ten authors and all their books, you're going to use this thing every day yeah. because you're going to be jockeying the books around, changing keywords. Um, your emails to KDB are probably ten times most of ours. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, and and Amazon's categories, the profile of the category change, the profile of the categories on a whole change uh, often. You know, Amazon will add new subcategories, which they'll suddenly appear in the database, and it's like, oh, uh, there's an opportunity, and they'll move some some of their books into it, and and then I'll see if one of mine might fit, and <laughs> send KDB an email, and it's it's all about visibility. Yeah, so, well, but for you, now, for now, it's free. Yeah, as you said, all about visibility. And um, without getting too technical here, how do you mine this information? Because obviously, this is all publicly available. It's just a case of, of setting something up that's going to gather it. I'm, I'm I'm reasonably curious, as long as this doesn't get mind boggling, as to how you do that. It's it's uh, there there are there are an enormous number of solutions for scraping data and none of those are I, I don't use any of those so it's basically uh, you uh, under the covers I have I have a set a set of main categories or main categories that would be the fiction bestseller ones that I start with and if you think of like your tree and navigating down a tree this category has these subcategories which have these subcategories I'll go through each of those and basically load the page and pull the data. Uh, but I only pull the data that, uh, that is of interest. And then there's also the marketing API that Amazon supports to give you, to try and to, to help you fill in the blanks. And for those, that's where there's an affiliate tag. So if you've ever done anything with affiliate earnings, that's a, there's a combination of the two that together allow me to develop a footprint or develop the common data set that I call it for a given category. And then I collect that five, time, five six times a day uh, because it changes you know, with the rankings and everything like that. And then at the, on a nightly, there's a job that runs that squishes it down into one entry per category because it's uh, for the day. There, there, there wouldn't be the need to keep five, the trend, there wouldn't be the need to keep the five to six a day when, which I call hourlies versus just the one if you're doing trend reports. Okay. Okay. So, and that, I... so that's like a job that runs on other servers yeah, removed yeah. of the front end servers. And that's that. So, but then there's uh, the technical side, there's the database and there's memcache and uh, just but... so that the user experience is very, very fast. So yeah. common re- common queries, like there's an ad hoc query. That's a good one. There's an ad hoc query report facility. So if you do an ad hoc query, I'll cache that so that the next person who might have the same query by chance doesn't have to go back to the back end and get it all over again. But then it refreshes every couple hours. Right. All set up. Well, I, I did understand that. And the result of it is this site, which is a very, very easy to use um, way of really digging into the detail of a genre that either you write in or you're thinking about writing. And as you say, I suppose this is for most of us, maybe two or three times a year when you're sitting down and making fairly big decisions about what direction your next book's going to go in, what direction your career is going to go in. And maybe people want to change genre or tweak it time spent with this tool. I'm, I'm just saying this, I'm going to say this is going to be time well spent. It's going to have a positive impact on your career. So it's, it's um, genrereport.com, uh, which I said at the beginning before the interviews, so people can follow along uh, whilst we're doing this. And uh, yeah, get in there while it's while it's cheap. While it's yeah. free. <laughs> while it's free. As cheap I as will it say, it, it, if I could add to that, if you are an author, if you're a writer, and you find yourself in a position that I found myself in where you were, it was almost like a, an, a sad and utter despair of having all these stories 
having the need or the want to write, but having no idea of what to write to because you can't find readers or you find yourself in a crowded room, uh, meaning a category, uh, and you just really want readers to find your book and you want that visibility, spend a little time on the site and find a category that you, oh, you know what, check out the books. I, I, for every category, I give you a sampling of the books yeah. so that you click on it and you could say, you know what, this story would fit here if I you know, adjust it or massage it or if you just have a premise of a story, you could say, "Oh, this is a category I want to. Re- I would love to write to." And it, for all, if you're lucky and you hit the lottery, you might actually find one of the categories you overlooked that you happen to read and you happen to love, and that just made it that much easier—a decision. Yeah, Brian, thank you so much. Part of the SPF community, and um, we're always keep, we have a, a bright and vibrant set of folks in our community and uh, to see people working hard again in the spirit of sharing your own skills um, to the benefit of others it's uh, it's great so thank you very much indeed and thank you for coming on to the podcast oh you're welcome it's been a blast thank you Brian Spangler, uh, one of these uh, techie guys who understands how to use that technology not just to play on his Xbox 360 and write games, but to use it for commercial gain. His Xbox 360, what decade oh, are we yeah, in? Oh yeah, sorry Xbox? about that, yeah, one. Um, <laughs> which is, our, our Xbox One's just blown up actually, by the way. Uh, so if Microsoft are listening, I'll give you my address. Um, but I thought it was really interesting and uh, it seemed to work because I was during the interview I was examining some of the areas and I could immediately start to drill down doing the subcategories and start uh, it became a bit addictive trying to spot that golden place where there are lots of readers looking for books and not too many books crowding the market yeah it's a really good tool Um, Brian's done a really great job on that and he's he's improved I looked at a kind of a beta version of it and made some suggestions to make it a little cleaner and a bit more make the important data more obvious um, and I think he's done a really excellent job on that. Now, it kind of ties in also with an interesting debate that's going on in, in the indie community at the moment, with, um, on the one hand, a camp that um, are only interested in writing what they want to write. And on the other hand, you've got uh, a camp, including um, authors like Chris Fox, who's a lovely guy we, sh- we definitely need to get onto the podcast, um, is kind of um, suggesting that writers write more to market. So. In other words, um, finding out using a tool like Brian's tool to find out where the uh, the spaces are in the market that can be filled with with your books, and this this debate does get quite heated sometimes because on the one hand people are saying you're selling out by writing for money, and on the other hand people are going well you're just being naive, right? You know, writing with no expectation of an audience is basically masturbation, and and there's there's that kind of debate going on all the time um now for me um i think the the path that you want to strike is somewhere in the middle you've got to think about it as a venn diagram for me so on the one hand you've got one big circle which is what you want to write what you enjoy reading what you'd like writing on the other hand you've got to have another circle which is what using a tool like brian's tool is to find out what um the what the what the market is looking for and then the intersection where those two circles overlap that is your sweet spot so you've got to it's got to be something that you would enjoy writing and something you'd also enjoy reading but also somewhere where there is a market i think if you go too much the either way it's going to be a soulless exercise that you won't enjoy um or you'll be writing something and and you'll never sell anything to anyone because there is no market for it so um these tools are really useful and brian's is a really good one um but i don't think just relying on them slavishly is not going to make you a happy or successful writer. It's, it's a tool that you can use, that you can um, influence your decision, but it shouldn't be the, the main thing that you that guides you. Yeah, sounds like wise words. And uh, I think that, that, that process of striking that balance, for me, goes beyond the big choice at the beginning of what genre, but actually in, in the editing process as well. So I'm certainly feeling my... I was reading through my latest editor's notes, and she is definitely saying things that wouldn't... That I, in, in my mind, I'm writing for a more educated audience, an audience who, like me, share a passion and an interest in this area. And she's pointing out that most people won't necessarily know, for instance, that CND's politics of the 1960s is as familiar to them as it is to me. And um, so I'm having to dumb down, it's a crude expression, uh, and I don't really mean it like dumb down, but I'm having to write in a way that, that I wouldn't 
the 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 person in my mind who's bought my book wouldn't need me to but she's not thinking about that she's thinking about my book being commercially successful that's right so i think even within the editing process there's that goes on yeah absolutely that's it's it's slightly it's it's that's a down the line consideration but yeah it's always you need to always have one mind on on how big your potential readership is and and you know not giving them all the information they need perhaps the information they don't need just making sure that it's it's the experience that, that they want to get at the end of the day yeah Good. Well, excellent. Um, and what I also love about Brian's interview is I love the fact that there is there are so many clever people out there in our community who think, do you know what, this might work. And I don't think Brian sat there thinking this is going to make me a millionaire. Brian thought I can do this and this could be useful. And that's always the beginning of probably a good business for him. I hope it is. Yeah, I mean, he's got a data background. Um, data guy has a, obviously has yeah. a bit of a giveaway, has a data background. Chris Fox, who I just mentioned, also works in data. So these are they probably wouldn't mind me describing them as geeks um, and you know geek is a kind of a is a sort of badge of honor these days um, but they're geeks with also with um, who love to write too so um, yeah that bit bringing that kind of mindset into the indie space um, you know I like I'm not as good I'm nowhere near as good at that as that kind of level of data handling but I can appreciate it and I I, I can work out spreadsheets you know, I do that quite a lot um, but to have those kinds of guys, real experts coming in and providing us with tools and ways to understand the data better is is to everyone's benefit. Yeah, love a good spreadsheet. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to our guest, Brian Spangler. And uh, we'll speak to you again. Have a great week next week. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.